Sudha Nanjapa, who is going to address you and talk to you about women's writing in the partition times. Professor Yashoda Nanjapa is someone I've known for a long time, a senior professor and someone who's a wonderful scholar and somebody who is deeply committed to teaching. She is a senior professor at the Yuvarajas College, professor and head of the department at Yuvarajas College, Mysore. She has 33 years of teaching experience and she's been teaching both PG and UG courses. As a research supervisor, she has guided nine research scholars who were awarded PhD degrees. And her areas of interest are women's writing, petition literature, and life writings. And this talk is also something which is a product of her research pro project on uh, partition writings and partition literature. So you have this wonderful speaker talking to you now, then on to Professor Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Krishna, for your very generous words. Uh, oh, it's a I pleasure, pleasure to, to have it. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we start now, uh, yeah. Professor? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On to Or should I on wait to, for a few yeah. minutes or? No, we could start. We could start. The questions are all almost all here. So, okay. we can, not a problem. Okay. Okay. Then I think I'll. Uh, yeah, okay. start yeah. my lecture. Please. Please uh, yes. Um, uh, in actually, in today's session, I would like to draw the attention of the participants uh, to some of the important women writers who wrote on the partition of India. Uh, there are many male writers who attempted to reclaim the human dimension of the tragedy and uh, whose works are indeed feminist, pluralist, and humanist. Uh, for instance, there is uh, Kushwan Singh, whose 1956 novel, as all of you know, uh, Train to Pakistan, which portrays vividly many facets of the great upheaval that accompanied partition, and uh, which is considered a very crucial document for historians and sociologists. Uh, then there are, as most of you know, Bisham Sani, and then uh, Chaman Nahal, Intizar Hussain, Sadat Hussein Monto, and then Mushirul Hassan, Krishna Shokti, uh, there is uh, Kamaleshwar, and then uh, Jill Dither, Alok Balla, for instance, you know, who was a professor at a uh, university in Hyderabad, and then uh, Gnanendra Pandey, uh, among many others who wrote extensively on partition. Uh, yet, uh, today I will limit my talk to some important women writers who are in, who, uh, in their writings both fictional and non-fictional, uh, bring to the fore the complex intricacies and then intimacies and intersections between gender, sexuality, and nation. Uh, their works demonstrate to us that the codes of honor uh, which define women within the family and the state uh, and show how this is extended to the uh, codes of honor within nationhood, I think, uh, this is something uh, which, which is very crucial because uh, this uh, code of honor or codes of honor were actually responsible finally for uh, the, the kind of violence which was perpetrated on women's bodies. So contextualizing the violence perpetrated on women during partition uh, within the social production of a discourse of uh, women's sexual purity, and then women as emblematic of tradition, uh, I would like to point out here how a discourse of uh, women as symbols, women as symbols of nation and uh, women's bodies as symbols of tradition, culture, community, and nation at large was actually responsible for the large scale, uh, unprecedented gendered violence, right, which took place during the partition. Uh, thus, in a way, the female body coerced to bear the burden of excessive symbolization, you know, as uh, markers of the nation, as keepers of the tradition, etc., consequently became the site for the performance of identity. In other words, uh, a site for playing out grossly violent acts by women 
of rival communities or women i mean by uh, i'm sorry by men of uh, rival communities or men of different communities uh, this was one of the main reasons for the frenzied and demonic violations and violence perpetrated on women's bodies uh, today i would like to draw your attention to all these factors uh, i will mention uh, a, a few very important books both fictional and non fictional works written by women right uh, so uh, if you take the year 1947 the year of independence also spelt a major divide in indian history and in the lives and minds of millions of indians the partition and the reconfiguration of the indian subcontinent into india and pakistan uh, was actually the beginning of a new order in the lives of the people of india the partition of the indian subcontinent we can compare it to the holocaust like you know like the holocaust uh, is a watershed moment in the history of the human kind and the sheer magnitude of the territorial division was india as a subcontinent and the accompanying demographic transformation that took place dwarfs all the other historical precedents we can say uh, it was not merely a territorial division partition brought about a profound rupture in the civilization of the subcontinent and uh, also in the psyche of the people uh, in historical and human terms what happened in the aftermath of partition is an irreparable tragedy an event of unprecedented magnitude and horror there are moments in world history when whole communities like you know we have seen this happen again and again especially in the uh, beginning of the 20th century you know there have been many partitions in the world uh, uh, and then there are moments in the world history like i said where whole communities become refugees and members of an entire population are rendered faceless undifferentiated uh, even suspect and finally hunted like it happened to the jews and the romanian gypsies uh, in nazi germany uh, to the uh, hututsi of rwanda and then uh, to the serbs in bosnia and the albanians in serbia and uh, this is what happened in the indian subcontinent at the time of independence like you know for most people uh, who lived during that period uh independence actually you know they felt that independent india got independence uh, when they noticed the bloodshed and the horror around them so uh, in what was to remain etched in the history as the largest post migration of the 20th century uh, an estimated 15 million people imagine you know the number is huge 15 million people were forcibly dislodged and approximately 100000 women were kidnapped on both sides of the border and the death toll was an unimaginable 3 million you know perhaps uh, the exact number will never be known you know in fact uh, there is uh, mushirul hasan uh, a very renowned historian uh, who says as on date it is you know uh, i mean we do not know how many people perished or became homeless and dispossessed in this mayhem uh we do not really have a, the exact records but uh, they put it at 15 million and 15 million is a huge number uh the partition of india compels our attention for it is undeniably a, a present day reality you know we would wonder why why partition literature and uh, you know after all these decades why go back to the partition of india and why uh, go back to you know the horror and the mayhem you know which was Uh, uh i mean which took place during that period but uh, it is undeniably a present day reality the consequences and the ramifications of partition uh, continue to define the social fabric even to this day and uh, it continues to define the everyday lives of the people within the context of india pakistan and bangladesh uh, and then Uh, if we come to partition research uh, it has become progressively a uh, developing field actually you know in recent years especially uh, the last three decades has seen a lot of progress in 
partition literature, historians, writers, researchers, feminist scholars, and uh, literary critics have over the years scrutinized, analyzed, and evaluated um, uh, you, you know, evaluated innumerable works. And uh, the last three decades especially marked a resurgence of literary interest in partition. And partition literature uh, has emerged as a very important genre in Indian literature. Uh, scholars working on partition have taken up uh, the task of creating new archives of survivors, memoirs, poetry, autobiographies, biographies, and fictional writings depicting the transitional period of uh, independence and partition. Yet, individual experience, especially women's experience, was mostly subsumed up till now, you know, up, up till very recently, uh, women's experience was mostly subsumed in dominant discourse and in meta narratives. Partition historiography evaded examining the massive violence and the experiences and emotions of the people who lived through it. Uh, the history of partition, especially of women, you know, the history of partition seemed to uh, lie only in the political developments. The moment we say the history of partition, it is always the political developments that led, that led up to partition. What happened to the millions who had to live through these? turbulent times, you know, what we might call uh, the human dimension of this history somehow seemed to have a lesser status. It wasn't really given much importance. And then uh, they really had no place in the history of partition. The human dimension did not have a place in the history of partition. Much of this reality lies subsumed uh, in what is otherwise perceived as the larger narrative of partition or the main story of partition. As, uh, uh, you know, Mushirul Hassan, the writer, Mushirul Hassan remarks, uh, you know, he says, uh, uh, partition story previously, you know, dominated by grand narratives need to, needs to be told differently. He says it needs to be told differently. And there is a need for a new language to deal with the historical traumas of the past. This is what, uh, you know, uh, I mean, um, uh, Mushirul Hassan says. Mushirul Hassan is a renowned uh, uh, historian who wrote extensively on the partition of India. Now, for more than 50 years after partition, there has been no feminist historiography of the partition of India. There wasn't anything, you know, about. Uh, women and women's experience written down. Uh, though there are accounts written by women historians on the on this cataclysmic uh, event uh, of partition, uh, they're all within the parameters of discipline and patriarchal norms. The story of 1947 has been written as being one of freedom and uh, one of you know successful attainment of independence. In truth. It is a gendered narrative of displacement and dispossession, of communal violence in an unprecedented scale, of the rescripting of identities of people, you know, rescripting of identities, national, you know, communal, familial identities, uh, etc. In the last 25 years, if we take, uh, many feminist historians and writers have attempted to restore women to history and to restore our history to women, you know, both ways, restore women to history and also restore our history to women. And uh, in doing so, they have made women a focus of inquiry, um, a subject of the story and an agent of the narrative. You know, this attempt has been made in the last three decades. If we uh, look at the kind of works that have been published, uh, the absence of women in historical events is actually not very surprising. Uh, many women writers and then feminist historians like Urvashi Butalia and then Ritu Menon and Kamla Basin, they have written landmark works. I have the books here. Maybe I'll take, we can, I can just show them to you. Uh, it's always an offline class is always better, right? And uh, Okay, uh, coming back to these feminist historians like Urushi Butalia, Ritu Menon, Kamla Basin, 
and then we have uh, joya chatterjee and uh, jill uh, didar and then gargi chakravarti most of them are from bengal and uh, others have focused attention on the uh, necessity of restoring women to history and have challenged partition history by reiterating that a uh, representative history can only be written if women's experience of partition is made an integral part of the narrative you know without women's representation you know women's the representation of women's experience of partition uh, you know uh, you cannot have a narrative it is certainly not an easy task as uh, historical i mean uh, yeah, i mean historical archives if you take do not have much to offer and then feminist historians and writers have taken recourse to examining other sources like women's letters and diaries and testimonies and memoirs in order to locate them in the history of partition ironically the truth remains that it is often fiction like ironically i would say the truth remains that it is often fiction not history that reveals the real impact of partition on women there are a uh, wonderful uh, books on i mean wonderful uh, fictional works by women you know uh, which talk about women's experience of the partition a careful look at the personal and fictional partition narratives with a conscious focus on women characters would throw light on the painful experiences of women as victims of, you know of partition of the subcontinent uh, in fact urvashi butalia in her uh, path breaking work the other side of silence you know this is i hope you can see the book the most of you all i think i'm sure you all know about this book because it is a landmark work the other side of silence voices from the partition of india you know she says a resounding silence she says uh, a resounding silence she says surrounds the question of women and partition and then uh recent feminist interventions attempting at uh recuperating women's alternative histories the long uh, lost forgotten stories of women's experience uh their gross violations rape and abduction in other words uh, uh it is the negotiation of national boundaries acted out on women's bodies during partition and uh, the effects of these experiences on their uh consciousness and subjectivity you know the i mean feminist interventions have brought out all these and then um in fact uh, you know there is this other book borders and boundaries written by reetha reetu menon and kamla basin where uh, they maintain that uh, you know no account of partition violence is complete uh, without you know bringing to the fore the details of violence against women now uh a whole range of women's narratives you know both fictional and non fictional uh construct the memory of partition as remembered by women you know hitherto uh they were elided or suppressed or you know very deliberately forgotten but uh, here you have you know uh, narratives which uh put forward partition as the violence you know and the mayhem as remembered by women uh they embody women's voices speaking for themselves you know it is not in somebody else's voice it is in their own voice that they you know try to uh put forward before us uh what partition was to them women's writings on partition address the ellipses of history and then especially women's histories you know uh in truth uh uh you know women's histories are inextricable from the histories of nation formation you know that's what we uh see and uh coming to these works the first one is uh, uh you know the other side of silence published in 1998 voices from the partition of india by urvashi butalia it's a landmark work it's a non fictional work and then uh we have borders and boundaries borders and boundaries uh women in india's partition by reetu menon and kamla basin this is also a very important book on uh you know partition especially you know with concentration on women's experience and then 
uh, we have uh, another book by edited by Ritu Menon, No Woman's Land, No Woman's Land, Women from Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh write on the partition of India. Like, you know, this is also a landmark work we can say. And then uh, there is another work titled Life and Words, right, uh, which is uh, written by Veena Das. Uh, these are pathbreaking works. And uh, then there are also, like, you know, books like, this is also an important book, Coming Out of Partition, Refugee Women of Bengal, you know, Coming Out of Partition, uh, Refugee Women of Bengal. And then uh, there is also an important book, you know, uh, titled Unsettling Partition, Gender and Memory. I think that's the title, Unsettling Partition. Uh, the full title is Unsettling Partition, Literature, Gender, and Memory. Uh, are you able to see when I show you the book? Are you able to see? Are you able to see yes, the book? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. If not clearly, at least maybe. Uh, yes, if, you, yes. if you are able to see it a little, you know. Uh, this is an important book by Jill Dither, Unsettling Partition, Literature, Gender, and uh, Memory. You know, these writers, uh, uh, drawing upon oral histories and then also, of course, official records have written about communal and gendered violence during partition. Uh, uh, like I said, Butalia and then Menon and then Basin have addressed women's experience of partition violence by recovering them from deliberate erasures. You know, they were almost like erased, but uh, they recovered them from deliberate erasure and implicated men as agents of gendered sexual and ethnic violence against women. They have documented the experience of women and children by using oral history and oral testimony. I'm sorry, not history, oral testimony, right? And uh, uh, coming to the fictional works, these are some of the non-fictional works, of course. There are many other, you know, fictional, I mean, non-fictional works by uh, male writers to Ayan Talbot and Gurupal Singh's The Partition of India is a very important book on The Partition of India, where to a small extent, like, you know, we do have women's experiences narrated here. And then we have Muhammad Umair Memon's uh, An Epic Unwritten. You know, this also is an important book uh, by, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, by Umar, Muhammad Umar Memon, and there are a whole lot of short stories in this. Lajwanti and the other, some of you might have heard of these stories. Uh, Lajwanti is one, and then there is uh, Jamila Hashmi's Exile, you know, which talk about women's experience. And then uh, there is a writer, Madhav Godbole, who compares the Holocaust, uh, I mean, compares partition to the Holocaust. Uh, he titles his book as the Holocaust of Indian Partition, an inquest, you know, a very important book on uh, the partition of India as a traumatic event, apart from, uh, you know, destroying the unity of India, you know, what exactly happened during the partition is put forward here. So now, um, these are some of the non-fictional works. And then there are uh, writers, like, if you take the fictional works, if you, you know, coming to the fictional works, uh, there are writers like Amrita Pritham. In fact, her novel, Pinger, was one of the first novels on uh, women's experience of partition, you know, which was written. Writers like, like I said, Amrita Pritham and then Atiya Hussain and Jyotirmai Devi especially. And then Babsi Sidwa, of course, you'd have heard of her. And then a writer by name Shauna Singh Baldwin and uh, Jamila Hashmi and Ismat Chuktai and then uh, Reema Modgil is one. And others uh, uh, have in their fictional works focused on uh, the relationship between nation, gender, and sexuality, and the connection between communalism and nationality in the perpetration of gendered violence, you know, perpetration of gendered violence during partition. Uh, thus, partition fiction and testimonies by women go against the grain as they play a very powerful role in supplementing or interrupt, uh, interrupting dominant accounts, you know, by uh, foregrounding alternate perspectives on partition. Uh, one of the first voices depicting the pain of partition 
was that of the Punjabi writer Amrita Pritham. Uh, and for a long time, hers was the only feminine voice rendering partition from a woman's perspective because her novel Pinjar, uh, which was published in the year 1950, just three years after partition, I mean, after independence, was later translated by Kushwan Singh with the title, The Skeleton. Uh, the novel later, I think in the year 2003, it was made into a film. Uh, the novel was too radical for its times as the wounds of partition and the communal hatred uh, when it was published in the 19, I mean, in the year 1950, you know, the communal hatred was still very raw. The, uh, the wounds of partition and then the hatred, the communal hatred was still, uh, you know, it, it was uh, still simmering and it was uh, very raw. Amrita Pritham was among the thousands who migrated from West Punjab to make a home across the border. Uh, in the winter of 1947, you know, she penned her uh, outstanding poem. Like, it is a wonderful poem. I like it, so I usually quote this. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the title of the poem is Today I Invoke Warisha. Warisha was, Waris Shah, uh, was a Punjabi poet. In the poem, she invokes the Punjabi poet, like, you know, Warisha. And uh, the English translation of the poem reads like this. You know, it says, Today I call Varisha, speak from your grave, and turn to the next page in your book of love. Once a daughter of Punjab cried, and you wrote an entire saga. Today, a million daughters cry out to you, Varisha, rise, O narrator of the grieving. Look at your Punjab. Today, fields are lined with corpses and blood fills the Chenab, the river Chenab. You know, this is uh, the English translation of the poem that Amrita Pritham had written because I think if I uh, am correct, I think Varisha talks about Hiranja's story, I think. You know, that's why she say, he says, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Amrita Pritham, I mean, the translation says, uh, I, uh, it says, once a daughter of Punjab cried and you wrote an entire saga. The saga, I think, was of Hiranja. And then, yet another writer who originally wrote in Urdu and was translated is uh, Kuratulan Haider. Her novel, Agkadariya, Agkadariya, translated to fire or river of fire, uh, was published in the year 1959 and it talks about the partition of the Indian subcontinent. Kuratulan Haider uh, was, con uh, I mean, conferred with the prestigious Padma Shri Award and also Padma Bhushan. And uh, she was one of the most important voices on partition. She often moved between India and Pakistan, exemplifying uh, the uh, dilemma of home and belonging in her personal life. And uh, she movingly evokes this, you know, uh, uh, in her novels title one is Sita Betrayed and the other one is uh, Fireflies in the Mist is another novel where she talks about partition. And then a very important uh, novel is by Jyotirmayi Devi. Jyotirmayi Devi's novel, Epar Ganga, Opar Ganga. It was published in the year 1968, Epar Ganga, Opar Ganga and translated by uh, Bengali, it was originally written in Bengali, translated into English by Inakshi Chatterjee, uh, translated to the river churning. It is titled the river churning. You know, most universities uh, prescribe this novel for study. Uh, I mean, uh, translated into English as river churning, uh, portrays how women's bodies are made the preferred sites for the operation of power. Uh, and this diffuse right through, you know, everyday domestic life. She brings out uh, this aspect very, very cleverly, very beautifully. She critiques patriarchy's obsession with women's chastity, chastity and uh, tabooed social contacts among Hindus and Muslims that led to the abandoning of women abducted and... Uh, uh, either abducted or violated during the communal riots, which took place at the time of independence. Uh, in doing so, her works actually break the silence surrounding the sexually victimized women and history's erasure of such women from its annals. You know, uh, sexually victimized women, 
uh, were you know completely erased from the communities completely you know th their presence was very disturbing for the communities you know this aspect she brings out very beautifully uh, the story you know of this novel uh, the river churning uh, is actually of uh, sutara datta a character by name sutara datta uh, who is an assistant professor of history in a women's college the attack on sutara during partition riots followed by her prolonged you know she was saved by a muslim family and uh, her prolonged stay with the muslim family who treated her like their own daughter and sheltered her you know all these branded her as impure polluted and as the other in her own native community and uh, the community is actually troubled by her mere presence her integration uh, into her original community almost becomes impossible because her body carries an alternative history the history of a violated woman and also the history of a woman uh, who had stayed for a number of years a couple of years at least with a muslim family you know this is brought out very beautifully by uh, jyotirmayi devi and uh, jyotirmayi devi takes a holistic approach towards understanding the dilemmas of women twice subjected to violence uh initially sexual violence and later social violence of you know total rejection by her own family her own people her own community etc and uh, 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 you know uh, these uh, urushi butalias like i was telling you the other side of uh, silence and then kamla basin and ritu menon's borders and boundaries are you know uh, are also like you know uh, uh, compilations of oral histories which talk about all these uh as against the works of male writers uh which are actually male writers works are objective documentations of the horrors of partition uh the works of these writers both fictional and non fictional if you take document individual women's uh, survivors testimonies and uh, i mean not the fictional ones i'm sorry the non fictional ones especially document individual women survivors testimonies each chapter you know in these works uh, contain powerful testimony uh, and uh, there are excerpts uh, combined with the writers compelling interpretative and metaphorical you know narrative uh, and then if we come to partition riots and violence you know partition uh, riots and violence had genocidal tendencies as uh they were more intense aggressive and brutal than any other you know that had uh, uh preceded them they, there is no precedence for the kind kind of uh, violence that was perpetrated during this time the works of these women writers show that what was alarmingly evident was that uh the victims mostly women were not merely killed it's not just killing the victims but uh, brutally tortured disfigured maimed and slaughtered uh, as the women as a human body you know uh, the woman's body here became the site of violence it was the female body which was considered the physical symbol of community identity and honor you know yeah, yeah i think for this uh, you should read partha chatterjee's uh, women's question there is a wonderful essay titled women's question you know uh, i mean here he talks about how uh, women's bodies become symbols of community community identity national identity and honor and uh, 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 this became the thus you know the women's bodies became women's bodies became vulnerable sites and targets for disfigurement by the hostile other right as the violence uh, systematically spread from the traditional public arena of conflict right uh, into the private space women and children were caught up in this maelstrom abduction of women rape mutilation brutal murder of infants and flaunting the corpses of the victims all these showed uh, levels of brutality that human beings are capable of you know we wonder whether human beings are capable of this kind of violence they uh wombs were cut open unborn children were you know pulled out of the wombs etc uh, you know are uh, the levels of brutality that a human being is capable of you know it leaves us 
horrified, something which is unprecedented, of course. And then Urvasi uh, Butalia and Ritu Menon and Kamla Basin show how one of the most troubling aspects, you know, of the 1947 violence was the death, the killing of women in the name of upholding honor, like I said, you know, upholding honor, honor killing of the women folk of the family to save them uh, from falling into the hands of the marauding and the rapacious males of rival communities. Uh, you know, it became something very common during the time of partition. One incident, yeah, uh, one incident to which Urvashi Butalia uh, devotes much attention is the mass deaths of uh, uh, sick women in 1947 uh, in a small town of uh, Toa Kalasa. You know, this is referred to by uh, Talbot and uh, Singh also in their work. Uh, a, a small village by name Toa Kalsa became uh, an epicenter for uh, a tragic incident because uh, about 105 sick women, you know, committed collective suicide by jumping into the village well when the village was attacked by the armed men of the rival community. A survivor relates how. Uh, his father personally beheaded, very proudly he says, a survivor says, uh, his father had personally beheaded 26 women of his own family in order to protect the honor of their community. Uh, this brings to the fore the notion of community honor and then gender relations and also how uh, there is a total disregard of the question of women's choice. You know, what is, what is the choice of a woman here under these you know, troubling circumstances. Uh, the event was viewed by many Eli nationalists as a uh, reflection of the glory of India's pure and you know, brave womanhood. In fact, you will be surprised if I read what Mahatma Gandhi himself you know, said uh, in a, uh, uh, during his speech you know, uh, at a prayer meeting in the year 19. 47 immediately September or so a few months after independence referring to this incident I will read out this because I think you know we should know most often history is forgotten or um, history is deliberately kept under wraps there is like you know Urvasi Butalia says there is a resounding silence especially when it comes to women's experience, I, I think we should know this. I, I will read this out. I thought I must read this out to y'all. Uh, this is what Mahatma Gandhi uh, 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 says uh, during a prayer meeting. He says, I have heard that many women did not want to lose their honor and chose to die. Many men killed their own wives. I think that is really great. Mark his words. I think that is really great. Because I know that such things make India brave. If such things make India brave, I'm sorry. That such things make India brave. After all, life and death is a transitory game. Whoever might have died are dead and gone. But at least they have gone with courage. They have not sold away their honor. Not that their lives were not dear to them. But they felt it was better to die with courage rather than be forcibly converted to Islam by the Muslims and allow them to assault their bodies. And so those women died. They were not just a handful, but quite a few. When I hear all these things, please mark these words. When I hear all these things, he says, I dance with joy that there are such brave women in India. This is Mahatma Gandhi's comment on uh, this Toa Kalasa incident. Uh, in fact, when I read through that, uh, I was really shocked that a man of his stature, I'm sorry, could make such a comment. And then uh, Butalia subverts the notion of martyrdom and then uh, by underscoring how women who died in family and community violence may have been coerced into taking their lives. They were forced to. Nobody would want to die willingly, right? Uh, would have been coerced into taking a, taking their own lives or they were murdered. You, what is called as dying in courage actually must have been uh, murders, you know, murdered by men of their own family, men of their own community, or, you know, were victims of 
of course, patriarchal consensus, patriarchal consensus. The truth nevertheless is elusive, you know, once again hidden in the wraps of silence uh, because uh, the voices of these women can never be recovered and they cannot come back to tell us what exactly happened. And uh, uh, another, like I was telling you, another work of which is path breaking is, you know, Ritu Menon's uh, No Man's Land and then uh, of course, Gargi Chatterjee, I have already mentioned, and then uh, Joya Ch Jargi, Gargi Chakravarti, I'm sorry, Gargi Chakravarti's work is an important work, you know, coming out of partition. Uh, Gargi Chakravarti actually talks about the refugee women, you know, women uh, after they, there was uh, an exchange of women, you know, refugees, women and children. And uh, what exactly happened to these refugee women? You know, it's brilliantly brought out in this book by Gargi Chakravarti. And then there is also, of course, Joya Chatterjee, who uh, most of these are Bengali women, spoils of partition, etc. And then uh, as much as through its history, we know partition, then, uh, you know, we also know it through the fictional representations. You know, I would like to dwell on some of the uh, fictional writings, very important fictional writings, uh, because, you know, there is also a strong belief that uh, partition can be best understood through fiction novels and short stories than, uh, you know, through dominant discourses. So uh, the one of the most important fictional works I would like to, you know, refer to is the Ice Candy, Ice Candy Man. There is no the Ice Candy Man, Ice Candy Man, Babsi Sidwas. 1988 novel, you know, where uh, Babsi Sidwa represents the historical violence of partition uh, from the perspective of uh, an eight, eight, nine year old polio stricken Parsi girl uh, whose name was, whose name is Lenny, you know, who lives in Lahore. Uh, what is special about this book is the entire book is from the perspective of this eight, nine year old, eight year old Parsi girl you know, a young girl by name Lenny, uh, belonging to a very affluent family. Uh, the novel weaves together multiple narratives of betrayal, of uh, duplicity, of infidelity, love, and then there is violence. All these based on Lenny's experiences as a witness. You know, why, why would you think a young girl, an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old young girl is chosen to narrate the story of partition? You know, such a a very serious story. Uh, why is she chosen to narrate the story? Because, you know, children don't lie, you know, because most often uh, there are a whole lot of lies surrounding the uh, stories of partition or, you know, whatever. So, uh, uh, so Lenny's experience as a witness of the harrowing events and conditions which were engendered by the partition of the Indian subcontinent is put forward here. Uh, Lenny notices, actually, as uh, she narrates the story, she notices how one day the people around her are themselves, and the next day, she comments, the next day, uh, they are Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, etc. People shrink, dwindling into symbols. The novel undercourse, uh, I mean, underscores or reflects how uh, the unimaginable violence perpetrated on women's bodies are pointers to the way uh, nationalism, which emerged in pre-colonial India, uh, dehistoricized women as individual subjects and uh, increasingly relegated them to their religious identities. Their bodies are encoded Hindu, Sikh, or Muslim. This is brought out very well in another book that I would be talking about, What the Body Remembers. Uh, the novel also brings to the fore the plight of thousands of abducted women. What happened to them? You know, their families did not want them back. Uh, the uh, countries of the new nation states of India and Pakistan exchanged their women forcibly many a time, right? But these women were not wanted by their families. So what happened to them? The plight of the thousands of abducted women and refugee women. Uh, uh, and then... Uh, the next uh, novel, because I think I'm running out of time, uh, the, the next novel that I would like to talk about is 
what the body remembers it's a brilliant novel you know the first novel written by shona singh baldwin a brilliant 1990 1999 novel and uh, yeah, it won the commonwealth prize uh, in the year 2000 so it is a very powerful and gripping chronicle of a sikh family in the undivided punjab set against the background of uh, the political and religious turmoil of independence movement and then later partition uh, in the process of narrating the stories of three main characters you know in this novel there are the three main characters are satya rupa and sardar ji two women and then one male character the novel foregrounds how uh, the state and the other dominant institutions construct women in subordinate ways and uh, reflects women's lived experience within the nation space against the backdrop of patriarchal power structures we can say patriarchal power structures and also hegemonic masculinity you know hegemonic masculinity uh, all this within the nationalistic discourse you know all this within the nationalistic discourse and uh, shona singh baldwin also shows how gendering the nation's boundaries you know which is done deliberately gendering the nation's boundaries and spaces causes the struggle for power and control to be uh, acted not just on the actual spaces of the nation but also on the symbolic spaces and what are these symbolic spaces you know these symbolic spaces are the female bodies actually so uh, uh, this uh, novel is worth reading an impressive first novel uh, the language is you know the language often borders on the lyrical a wonderful novel though a little bulky but it's a very very good read and then there is at another interesting novel that i happen to stumble upon uh, when i uh, you know visited a bookshop and uh, this is the last novel i think that i would discuss here since i'm running out of time i want you to know about this for a particular reason i want you to know about this though it uh, did not become a, a, a best seller or whatever but then i want you to know about this for a certain reason uh it is reema modgil's literary debut actually titled perfect eight perfect eight published in the year 2010 perfect eight was published in the year 2010 uh it actually traces the yeah this is the book if i have been able to show it perfect eight perfect eight here is a picture of the uh refugees of the partition and uh, it's a literary debut uh and then of rima mohil let us say it traces the story of a young girl by name ira and her mother the mother was a partition survivor uh in fact intricately woven uh our interwoven with their personal story is the turbulent history of modern india and uh, the complex ramifications of communal violence which took place during that time the novel traverses beyond partition starts with partition but goes much beyond partition through the decades after uh, indian independence punctuated by events like uh, the emergency and then uh, 1984 anti sikh riots in delhi uh, the hindu muslim riots and then followed by the demolition of babri masjid and then also the innumerable communal riots that uh, time and again shook india you know to the core the novel subtly reiterates the unrelenting chain of communal violence which periodically erupt in india and have their roots embedded in the events which ensued during partition so it is like you know what happened during partition uh, actually has a very strong influence on uh what is the communal riots which are which have been taking place you know in india after that and then such events make us conscious of the relevance and immediacy of partition in the present and uh, uh, there is a writer by name jesodara bagchi actually i have a book of jesodara bagchi uh, she was also i would like to mention her because she was a uh, a very well known professor um 
uh, in the women's studies department of Jadavpur University. She was very well known. This is the tra trauma and triumph. Like, you know, in this book, she says, uh, partition, she says, is very much the part of, you know, uh, our present condition, very much the part of our, I missed out on the exact words, but she says, it is a part of our present condition, uh, burdened as it is by the partition of our minds. You know, the partition was not just of the country, but the partition was also of our minds. And then in the years that followed uh, partition, the memory, you know, uh, became so traumatic. You know, the traumatic memory became such an integral part of the identity of the survivors and the trauma created self images of vulnerability, defenseless and weaknesses, like, you know. Uh, uh, why I would say that this book is very important. It's not just talking about the violence that took place during that period. Uh, yeah, in fact, in Rima Modgill's Perfect Eight, Ira's mother's traumatic, because she was a partition survivor. In fact, Ira's mother was actually the partition survivor. Her mother's traumatic memory of partition endures in her and she suffer, suffers uh, an acute sense of loss and estrangement from identity. You know, what her mother suffered, the daughter suffers, though the daughter herself, you know, uh, for Ira, the experience of partition uh, is not a lived one. She did not actually experience partition. Yet she is left with an intense, you know, consciousness of lack, um, an emptiness, and a feeling of exile and a fear of the unknown that, you know, and it haunts her every moment of her life. You know, this is something, it's very grippingly written. Uh, the question here is, how does one remember an experience one has actually not lived through? Because uh, Ira, the daughter of the partition survivor, remembers the entire, you know, the struggle of her mother as though she herself had gone through it, right? You know, the question is, how can one remember an experience which one has not actually lived through? Uh, in fact, this is a very, there is a very interesting uh, concept, uh, which was um, a, a term which was coined by Marian Hirsch, uh, who talks about Holocaust, you know, she uh, referring to such a memory, a mem the, I hope you understand, I hope I'm putting it across properly, because for me, this is very important. Uh, th the memory is not your own memory. The memory is, you know, the memory of somebody else who is very close. Here it is the mother who is very close to the daughter. It is a memory of the mother that the daughter carries. You know, I hope I have made it clear. Uh, and, uh, you know, this kind of carrying the memory of somebody else, you know, uh, uh, this is, I mean, referring to such a memory among the children of the Holocaust, you know, Marian Hirsch was the first to coin a term, you know, uh, uh, I mean, children of the Holocaust survivors, Marian Hirsch coined this term post memory, the term is post memory. And uh, the generation after those who witness trauma or psychologically experience the trauma and uh, remember vividly, very clearly the experiences of their parents or somebody who is very close to them, as close to them as their mothers, maybe, as if they are their own memories. You know, this is post memory. The children of the Holocaust survivors remembered what happened to their parents, especially what happened to their mothers as though it actually happened to them. And that memory is so real that, you know, they cannot believe that it did not happen to them. This is the, the term used for uh, this kind of a memory is post-memory and the term is coined by Marian Hirsch. Like we say, certain memories never die, but are even inherited. So uh, then, <laughs> you know, the time is running out. There is the writer, uh, Savitramma from Karnataka, I have to mention her because though South India did not experience the kind of turbulence that the north, northern part of India went through during the uh, independence and during the partition, uh, there is a writer from Karnataka because she is a writer from Karnataka. Her name is Savitramma, who merits mention here. What feminist critics find surprising about Savitramma is that uh, hers is one of the 
rare instances of Kannada fictional, uh, you know, literature, uh, which actually touches upon uh, an issue like partition, communal fury, and their impact on women, you know, uh, in the hitherto secure space of the family. Uh, in fact, in a collection of short stories, which is titled Nirashrite, uh, uh, translated to refugee. Uh, and imagine it was brought out in the year 1949, you know, almost immediately, even before Amrita Pritham's uh, Pinjar was published in the year 1949. At least three stories in this uh, collection are set in the backdrop of partition and one in the context of the national movement and, uh, uh, you know, for independence, you know. Uh, and again, in the year 1954, she published a collection of short stories titled Maru Madhuve, you know, where, uh, which is, uh, can be translated to remarriage, uh, where there is a particular short story titled Damayanti, which is set, in, I mean, uh, which is actually set in the context of partition. Uh, so there are a whole lot of short stories like this. I think I'll have to wind up sometime now. Then there is uh, Lajwanti's, Lajwanti written by Rajender Singh Bedi. I, I hope some of you at least must have come across this short story, a very, very powerful short story, which talks about uh, the gendered uh, sexuality of women. And then there is Jamila Hashmi's Exile, you know, which very surprisingly uses the Sita myth, you know, uh, uh, the short story is titled Exile. So, uh, uh, you know, what I'll try to wind up, you know, uh, before I try to, before I wind up, uh, there is another, uh, I mean, very recently, 2002, there was uh, a novel published. Uh, uh, and uh, this novel was originally written in Hindi. Uh, the title of the novel is Tomb of Sand, Tomb of Sand, uh, written by Geetanjali Shri. Geetanjali Shri, and it was translated, I forget the name of the person, some Rockwell, you know, translated this uh, novel. What is significant about this book is, it is a book on partition, where, you know, we have an 80-year-old widow who, uh, uh, you know, comes to India during partition, and she decides to travel back to Pakistan uh, to deal with her traumas and, you know, go back to Pakistan, to her homeland, etc. What is significant about this book is that uh, it is the first Hindi novel, first Hindi novel to win the uh, 2022 International Booker Prize. It won the International Booker Prize, you know, for 2022. The first Hindi novel uh, translated, one translated into English, which won the International Booker Prize, and of course, the fifty thousand um, pound, uh, you know, check which was given uh, was, uh, uh, I mean, divided equally by the writer and the translator. Now, I think I'll wind up. Uh, seven decades after independence, the tragedy of partition now actually uh, recedes increasingly into the past, and then uh, there is the danger of forgetting it gradually. And then the question is, uh, would it really matter if nobody remembered the partition anymore? Does it matter? You know, that if we forget partition, does it really matter? What are the imperatives that enjoin us uh, as Indians living in a secular, I mean, secular nation to bear in mind the history of partition? You know, why should we remember partition? These are the questions which haunt every thinking Indian who is aware of the uh, very volatile nature of religious issues in India as we see today. We have witnessed many, many incidents which have shown uh, uh, the volatile nature of religious issues, right? Partition also raises profound and disturbing questions about uh, the ease with which people, especially women, you know, can fall victims to political, social, and communal strategies uh, manipulated often by those who uphold patriarchal structures of the society. You know, patriarchy, whatever said and done, you know, we can't wish away patriarchy. It is there, like, you know, it takes, a. am sure it will take a very, very long time 
for us to really come out of patriarchy or the patriarchal structures of the society. The gendering of the nation space, which is inextricably associated with the ideology of feminized India. We say Bharat Mata, you know, Bharat as a mother, right? The image of India as a mother. Uh, uh, it brings out women's sheer powerlessness and the lack of choice in the face of subjugation and coercion and uh, strategic violence as, you know, uh, seen during partition. Forgetting partition would certainly not be life affirming. I don't think we should ever forget partition. I think it is important that we recall the terrible event and even internalize, you know, if I can, if I may say this, internalize the lessons from it. For as has been, you know, uh, well said, uh, those who fail to learn from history, they say are condemned to repeat it, you know, so we should never fail to learn from history. All this make it critical and imperative that understanding of partition is of tremendous, you know, present day relevance. We have to remember uh, partition, it is very relevant. And then I'll uh, wind up uh, by maybe all of us know that uh, uh, 14th of August uh, is observed as Partition Horrors Remembrance Day, you know, and uh, I think it is a significant move. I think it is a significant move because we need to remember partition. We need to remember the violence that, you know, uh, was the offshoot of partition because something like that should never happen in our country. Right. So on that note, I will stop here and uh, if I, I think 11 o'clock is the time, right, that I should stop at 11. I'm supposed to stop at 11 and then uh, maybe if you have any comments, more than questions, if you can. Good morning, ma'am. Yes. Good morning. yes. Good morning. Yeah. Yes, yes, you are definitely. I am Dr. Shiva Nayana from Tamil Nadu. Uh, ma'am, I am really awestruck by the memory, mind blowing memory that you have. Ma what a lot of books that you could recollect. And I'm really excited <laughs> <laughs> to listen to your talk, ma'am. The one no, thing. Like, that uh, yeah, the, just a moment because, you know, I have a whole lot of them and I've been reading them, a uh, whole lot of them, which, you know, I couldn't refer to some of them because, you know, like. Partition Dialogues by Alok Balna and all these are very important books because I had a UGC project on partition. And, yeah, I worked on partition. That Maybe that's one reason. Okay, yes. Right. Anyway, it's very yes. inspiring. I would like to ask you a question. Ma. Actually, yeah. you know, we approach the partition literature, especially the partition novels, uh, more than a literary work. We try to understand the history behind it. So my question is, how far authentic or reliable are the partition novels? For example, when you take Pushman Singh's train to Pakistan, he presents mm -hmm. a story from a Hindu perspective. The same way when yeah. you accept yeah, the Babsi Fitzgerald's Ice Candy Man, it's again another perspective. You're partly looking at it from a more uh, Islamic perspective because the train that arrives at Amritsar induces a kind of violence in uh, Ice Candy yeah. Man. The train yeah. that arrives at Amritsar I mean, with uh, yeah. Hindu bodies, mutilated bodies, arouses violence there in Kushwan Singh now. Yeah. So, as yeah. an ordinary uh, Indian, when we look at these two contrasting pictures that are presented to these respective writings, which one can be okay. taken as an authentic one? And, uh, no, no. I think that would be very difficult to answer, like, you know, which perspective should be taken as authentic. But uh, I, I think, you know, uh, if you take Kushwan Singh's train to Pakistan, uh, it is very relevant because I don't think he takes, I mean, a writer like Kushwan Singh wouldn't take a particular stand, definitely. Maybe he mentioned Hindu bodies or whatever, but then I'm sure he's not taking a particular stand when it comes the to religion. Incident, the seminal incident that he presents is the train that arrived at Amritsar carrying yeah, the body. Yes, yes. Right, ma'am, but yes. in the case of Pakistan, yes. what? Islamic demons, uh, I mean, no, no, it, it, is, it is, I'm sorry, it is definitely not an Islamic perspective because no. the young girl here is a Parsi, yeah. right? The young girl, Lenny, yeah, who narrates the, or from whose perspective the entire story is narrated, is a Parsi girl, right? And then uh, uh, the Aya who looks after this girl is Shanti, 
she is a hindu right and then uh, there are that like you know that's why i if you remember i mentioned once i made a statement i said uh, on a particular day ev everyone is just a human being and the next day when these partition i mean when the violence starts erupting then one becomes a hindu one becomes a muslim one becomes a sikh one becomes a parsi you know suddenly you know there is a division right so i don't think she talks about you know the, the partition violence from any perspective and that's the reason maybe that's why i said the story being narrated from the perspective of a young girl as young as 8 years she is 8 years as the story progresses she is 9 years old uh, uh, you know uh, you cannot like you know how do you justify this a young girl narrating or telling us about the violence especially the uh, of abducted women of refugees though not you know putting it across in a very clear manner but then her understanding of these refugees so i don't think there is an islamic perspective at all these writers as i have read through you know they are very very objective they are very objective you know that's why i said uh, the reality of partition can also be you know understood from fictional works and that's an irony because dominant narratives kept the women's experience under wraps for a very long time you know talking about women's sexuality talking about rape and talking about the mutilation of women's bodies uh was not done for a very long time right yeah, yeah. so <laughs> so any other if not a question a suggestion or a comment on this excuse me madam yes uh, you quoted uh, one uh, mahatma gandhi statement yes yes in fact i didn't quote i read out actually that's why <laughs> in which book madam book. in yeah. which book madam in ah, which this book is, it is this is yeah this is uh, unsettling partition hmm. by, by unsettling partition by jill dider by jill dider and in the introduction part of unsettling partition okay. uh, she quotes because it's not directly from the speech but you know she uh, quotes mahatma gandhi uh, here and it is uh, from a speech at a prayer meeting held on september something september i if the date is not here but i checked actually i verified before i because you know sometimes reading material like this you know can be i can't use the word hazardous right uh, so september 1947 you know he mentions this in a or he talks about this in a prayer meeting so okay. it is your print that's why you know deliberately i did not write down i read it out from a book okay, okay. 